For those of you who are worried, anxious, confused about what to do with your students who you think have experienced or are experiencing trauma, you are going to find a lot of answers today. Justin Sanceri, a licensed therapist who works with the public schools in California, has generously ceded some of his very little free time to give us some background on what our students may be feeling and techniques that we can use to create a safe place for them to be and to express themselves. Justin explains how trauma can become normalized to the benefit of students who are experiencing it and for the educators around them who are affected by this angst through the explanation of the polyvagal theory, a biological rundown of how the body responds to stress and unexpected danger cues. If we understand the latter up and down the polyvagal theory, and yes, you're going to hear that term a lot in the next few minutes, our student's stress may very well go down as they'll see how it's a physical response and not something they do voluntarily because they're weak or emotionally immature or whatever messages their minds may be telling them. No, it's an evolutionary response that is completely natural. Let's listen now to how Justin expertly explains this phenomenon, how he treats students who are experiencing trauma, and how he masterfully leads them through the steps back down the polyvagal ladder, showing them how they can learn to calm themselves down so that they can interact with others in appropriate and productive ways. You'll find activities to use Justin's conversation in your classes in the show notes of Doorways to Learning with Donna and information on how to contact Justin as well. Now let's listen to his soothing voice as he explains the rocky roads of emotional anxieties. So Justin, thank you so much for being here. I'm already interested in everything you're going to share with us. I sent you a bunch of questions and this is just how professional you are and then really carefully and sent me a whole bunch of new ones, which is exactly what I wanted you to do. Could you tell us your background, your public and private practice, and then we're going to get a little bit into your specialty. Okay. Yeah. Uh, background is I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in California. I also do um, some coaching on the side. I currently work for a public school system. And I work with high schoolers mostly. Uh, over the years, I've been doing therapy for like 15 years or so. I've been in the school system for eight. This is my eighth year. And mostly with high schoolers, but I've you know worked with kids of all ages across over the years. Lots of family therapy experience, a lot of parenting skills, uh, parenting groups that I've run. But uh, currently, I'm working with high schoolers, and I have actually kind of an interesting mix. I have two main sites, and one of them is a continuation high school. So kids that have a lot of behavioral problems, uh, drug use, gang involvement, that kind of stuff. Um, and then I do a podcast called Stuck Not Broken. I do private practice on the side every Saturday morning and content creation, all kinds of stuff that I'm, that I'm up to. I love it. <laughs> I love doing therapy. I love all this stuff. Mental health is so important. Emotional health is so important in the school system. And you know much better than I do that if we don't address the effective domain, then students aren't going to be learning. And it sounds like the populations you're working with, it really kind of manifests in both of those populations. I don't need to share too much of my private life, but I have no problems in saying that I grew up in a really volatile home. And I think that if my teachers had known about mental health and about emotional health and about techniques to help us all. And I'm not blaming them at all because we just weren't trained yeah. that way. But I think that if we had learned in school how to become more self-aware and how to monitor ourselves a little better, all of us would have been a little healthier. So what I love is now to talk to specialists like you so you can suggest to teachers and other educators what they could be doing, just inserting little techniques and things like that sure. into their classroom. Yeah. But what I, I guess the direction I'd like to go in is your specialty because it's polyvagal theory that is yeah. your special. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, polyvagal theory. Yep, that's it. Yeah. yeah, and I think okay. once once we have an understanding of what that is, then we can, those techniques that teachers might be able to implement uh, will make more sense as to like why this, this or that technique may be helpful in developing the more emotional uh, intelligence of their students or what we call in the polyvagal world co-regulation and self-regulation, which I hope we'll get into. But yeah, it's yeah. the polyvagal theory is not a therapy. It's not a modality. It's science. It's the science that really kind of explains a lot of human interaction. I think the, or mammalian interaction really, but uh, 
the easiest way to put it is it's it's the science. Yeah, it's the science of human interaction. It's how we respond to safety. So how we respond to each other when we're in a safe context, but also how we respond in dangerous context, what happens to ourselves on a biological uh, uh, nervous system level. That's really what it's about. So therapists and other professions as well, but therapists in particular, especially ones who are more into uh, working with traumatized individuals, we saw polyvagal theory and we're like, well, this makes sense. This is, this relates to what we're doing. And this explains, it's really the scientific explanation biologically of what's happening in the people that we're serving who are traumatized. And so therapists kind of, you know, ran with it. They, they really, uh, I think, especially trauma focused therapists really kind of like scooped this up and ran with it. And it's, it's uh, infusing itself into other areas. Yoga is a, is a big area where polyvagal theory has a lot to do with it. Uh, even the medical profession, but it's really like, yeah, it's, it's the science of human connection. That, that's the kind of the way I would put it in, in one, one sentence. Well, that's interesting because I've heard some podcasts with you. And what I'd really love is for the listeners to connect with you so that you can go into it more in depth and to really help them. Yeah. But what you're really dissecting the biology of it so that I'm fascinated now because this is what I love, the human connection. So can okay. you explain the balance between those two? And I guess, um, you know, polyvagal theory 101 or minus 101 so that we can <laughs> get into how that translates into the school yeah. and how we can help students. Well, the, the basic idea is like, I'm sure everyone's heard of like fight and flight. People respond. At it. So that's something, but it, there's there's more to it. And according to polyvagal theory is that when we're in, let's start with dangerous situations. We're in danger. Yeah, humans might respond with fight or flight, but there's also another response, which is shutdown. So one response could be that we, you know, there's a danger in the, in the environment. And so we run away. So flight. Uh, the other response would be fight. We get aggressive and we, you know, aggress upon the danger. And the third danger response would be uh, shutting down, where we collapse and immobilize. And that's that is a response to something that is life threatening. There's also another response potentially, which is the uh, freeze response, which is more of like a panic, like a catatonic, you go stiff kind of thing. So there's different defensive responses that we go through. But what political theory teaches us is that it's not like we choose to do these things. No one's choosing to run away exactly. Our body simply uh, shifts into a defensive state and we actually go through these things in order. So if we can't be safe, like right now you and I are, are safe, we can smile with each other. If we were in person, we could probably make eye contact and laugh, right? So we're, we're in our safety state or enough in our safety state to be able to do those things. But if there, if, we, if there was some sort of like danger or something that was loud that we didn't know what was going on, we would shift out of our safety state we would lose access to the things like making eye contact and smiling all those things we would lose access to that and the first thing that we would do is shift down what we call the polyvagal ladder we shift down into our flight sympathetic energy and what that means is that whatever the danger is the first thing that we would do is try to get away from it so if, it, if there's like a true danger let's say there's like a, a tiger or something like that in, our, in the classroom and so the first thing we would do is look for the exit to get out of there. Okay. So, but if let's, let's say the tiger is in front of the exit or is cornering us. So the second thing we would do is if we can't run away, if we can't escape, the next thing we would do is uh, use our fight state. And it's, again, it's not like we're choosing to, our body shifts into these different states, but you know, the, the tiger is kind of big. So maybe we try and throw things at it. We use our, we use our upper body to throw things at it or push or so. I don't know. It's not going to go very far. It's not going to do very much probably. So the last thing that we would do is either freeze or shut down. And what that looks like is we tense, we immobilize basically. Instead of mobilizing to run away or to fight, we immobilize and either tense up or go limp. But that is, it's not like we're choosing to do these things. Our body goes from safety to flight fight to shut down or freeze. So it's these, it's a sequence of autonomic shifts. That's the polyvagal theory kind of lays out that that's the sequence of things that happens, but it also highlights the importance of the safety state and that being safe and being able to socially connect, being able to think critically, being able to weigh pros and cons, to learn new things, to you know follow classroom norms and whatnot, to children and, and adults as well. But we, they don't do these things unless they have access to their safety state and then can actually you know, do those things. If, if, so if a child's in flight fight, they don't memorize things very well. They're not going to be able to sit there and think critically and collaborate with others in small groups. 
I'm not sure how we got here, but, but that, that's the basic idea of bald eagle <laughs> theory and the, and the shifts that we go through. <laughs> no, no, you explained it really, really well. And it makes a okay. lot of sense to me. And the way that I've um, sort of uh, compartmentalized it is through the limbic system. If that, What I understood about the brain is if the limbic system is relaxed, then we can let new information go further into the brain. But if the limbic system is detecting danger, then we freeze. And I mean, danger could be a friend saying something a little nasty to yes, us or exactly, yeah. a teacher instead of a tiger, a teacher screaming at us. Unfortunately, that happens. It could very yeah. well be, look, you know, our bodies react it's to true. it like a tiger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it's it's not even, let, we'll take it even more granular. The polyvagal theory has a number of different uh, hypotheses or points it puts out. One of them is called neuroception. It's, it's this idea, our brain stem. So we, we detect cues from the environment of safety or danger which go to the brainstem and the brainstem sort of decides safety danger or life threat if we're in safety we can socially engage and so our brainstem will activate our higher brain functions but it'll also calm our heartbeat it'll allow us to breathe fully into our bellies so if the brainstem detects we're safe we're with safe people and we have a safe environment then it sort of activates all this safety biology in our system. Uh, so that involves like the critical thinking and whatnot. So let's take it, take it, take it back a step further here. The brainstem is not just like the large thing like a tiger, right? And it's not even just the large things like a teacher yelling, which does happen. But it's also like super small things that you wouldn't even think about. So, you know, like the lighting and, the, and I have an orange light back here. It's a very soft orange light, which most people find soothing versus like compare that to the harsh or what I consider harsh bright white lighting in a lot of classrooms that you know can't really be dimmed or turned down a lot of times so it's a, it's a small thing it's not a big deal but those little things do affect our system our, our brainstem is going to identify those as more or less safe and again it's not a huge deal but if you have the harsh lighting plus the classroom's a bit too cold that day plus you just got you know your parents yelled at you that morning Plus there's issues with your friends, like all these things kind of build up and none of them by themselves is maybe a major deal, but when you start adding them up, that's going to result in a kid who probably has less access to their safety state. And so it's not just the big traumatic things. It's also these little things, like these little insults to our system that kind of just add up. So I suppose what you're saying, they disconnect for me is a little bit the drama of the polyvagal theory. But you're working with high schoolers and teenagers. Yeah. And, and my favorite years were working in high school. And I used to tell the parents, their job is to fight us. Their job is the drama. <laughs> so it's Kinda, obvious yeah. that Kinda, you know, yeah. teen, teenagers are going through all this and they have, they're so sensitive and they're taking in a lot of information, especially now with all the digital and the social media information. So I guess what seems to be disconnecting for me and what mm. I'm hoping you can provide you know, the bridge towards is this theory and your work. Because it seems like, are you just working with the traumatized kids or all teenagers are traumatized to a certain extent? I think that it's the, the kids that I work with are more on the traumatized end of things. They've been through something, likely, um, but more than likely, the kids that I work with, they've been through many things. They haven't been through like one traumatic incident. They've actually been through a home that is flat out traumatic. And they go home to a flat out traumatic home every day. They they lack safety and connection. And it can there's a gradient of what that could look like, but um, the vast majority of the kids I work with over the years have some level of disconnection with their parents, or they've been through some downright abusive or traumatic things. Uh, plus, outside of the home, they've been through at, at least one thing or more. I, I don't tend to get super specific with this stuff. I just keep it general. So when I do this polyvagal stuff. Uh, most kids don't want to hear about, you know, the biology of what they're going through, at least the kids that I work with. But when you start to break down, oh, this is why you reacted this way in this context, it really helps to normalize. So one of the benefits of the polyvagal theory is it's, it's normalizing rather than saying, well, why didn't I act that way? Or why didn't I do this? Why didn't I fight back? Why didn't I, whatever. Rather than asking that question, it, it's now like, oh, that's why I didn't. You know, it just it provides an explanation of I didn't fight because I was in a shutdown state, right? I didn't fight because I was able to successfully run away and that mitigated the situation and I didn't need to maybe. So it gives a normalizing and that's what people say a lot is now I have an answer. 
and I don't have to evaluate and judge myself and shame myself for how I think I should have reacted or how society tells me I should react to whatever it is. All right. So if you don't mind, you don't want to say anyone specific, but just imagine one of your patients. And what yeah. what I'd like to do is give the teacher something to work with. And what would they see in their classroom and think, ah, okay, this is not a, a student that is intentionally being disruptive. Oh, this, yeah, that's a great question. This, yeah. Okay. Keep going because I'm not sure which question you're hearing, but if you like it, go with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first off, I like the aspect of the intentionality because... I mean, ultimately, we have to take responsibility for our choices. And yeah, we should hold each other, I think, accountable for our choices. But at the same time, there is some significant level of there, there's not intentionally doing this. The, the, the child might not be simply seeking out attention. You know, they literally are going to school in a state where their body is prepared to run away or fight or shut down and collapse. So when you see that kid in the class with the hoodie over their head and they're just like checked out, that is a kid who's probably in a shutdown state. Their their body is depleted of energy. They have no flight fight energy in their system. They are like checked out in a, in a very real sense. They made it to school, which is amazing. And school might be the most safe context in their life, like literally. So they made it there, but that might be the most they can do that day. They're kind of making a choice, but also their body is not prepared to do much else. Their body is in a state of shutdown or conservation. Everything, their, their heartbeat, their breathing, all that is slowing way down. Like biologically, they don't have much to give. So yeah, we hold them accountable, but is there intentionality in what they're doing? Do they want to do that? And like, when you talk to them one-on-one, no, they don't. So as far as intentionality goes, I think that is like, that might help teachers to normalize and see with more compassion or more empathy that this kid is not just trying to be difficult. Like they really are stuck in a biological state of defense. That's what I heard you asking. Sorry if I got that wrong. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's exactly what I was saying because it takes a lot of self-reflection. When teachers are new, sometimes they they react instead of, I mean, it really depends on how, who sure. they are personally, but instead of reacting and, and assuming something, what we can encourage is that they assume the other way that the student is not doing it intentionally. Mm. And, you know, the whole hoodie thing is so dramatized in the media and it doesn't have to be. So we always make these assumptions and prejudices about students who aren't acting in the classroom as we would like them to be, you know, the ideal student. I mean, I had a student that was was in a family that was so it was so dysfunctional. He probably didn't get any sleep at night. So I let him sleep. I mean, I simply let him sleep yeah. a couple hours yeah. during the day. And that was the best I could do for him. I believe that. I completely believe that. So what I'm hoping is that teachers will listen to what you're saying and, and think, okay, so I have a student that comes in with a hoodie and I don't have to assume that he's doing that or she's doing that because she wants to confront me. She's doing it because that is the best she can do. How would a student eventually get to you? This teacher sees a student that needs a counselor. Uh, the counselor gets involved. And then what happens so that you get involved? The counselor basically say, this is too much for me. If a student were to come to me, it, it kind of depends on what state they're in, but there, there's some things that I'm going to do that are the same for every kid I meet with, which is be a safe individual. I'm going to make sure that I'm in my own safety state and able to provide them with safety or what we call safety cues. And that would be gentle eye contact. Uh, that would be uh, vocal prosody, which is I'm not going to speak like to monotone. I'm not going to talk like this. I'm kind of doing it right now where the voice goes up and down. If we can do that, that signals to the other person listening, the other, that I'm a safe individual. So that, so those kind of things will help. I'm going to do other things that might not be super obvious, especially if it's a teenage girl or a girl. And I, I ask the boys as well, but I, I make sure to ask the girls, which is when they come in, I ask, is it okay if I close the door or do you prefer it open? There's some things that look exactly the same that show them, look, I'm considering you and I am a safe individual for you to to sit down and chat with if you want to. Um, and for that student, the best that they can do that day, like maybe we come up with a plan of like, you're not doing very well in class. Maybe we could talk with your teacher about how can we get some, realistically, how can we get some work done today? And they might say, at least at my school, one of my sites, we have this place called the Zen Den. It's a room that's just, it's a quiet place for kids to go to and crash and if they need to, and it gets used pretty often. But sometimes kids will go there and they'll do work by themselves because that's the best they can do. They'll have the lights off in there, the doors open, but they'll turn the lights off and there's like pillows in there and there's pictures of nature on the walls and stuff, but they'll go in there and they'll turn the lights off and they'll just get work done. And that is the best that they can do. And it's like, that's better than crashing in class and, and falling asleep or putting the hoodie over your head. So 
the teachers are fine with it at my school. So we do that with something like that. If a kid's in more of a fight state, I'm going to be a little more amped up with them. I'm not like yelling at them, but I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what happened. And my eyes might be a little bit wider and I'm more energized. I'm using my body more. So I'm meeting them in their energy, but I'm still giving them safety cues. I'm still an active listener. And I'm not talking about like taking their side if they're complaining about a teacher. I'm not going to agree with them. I'm not going to say, yeah, you're right. That teacher is a so-and-so. It's not about that. It's more about like, oh, I can't believe, you know, that that's how you felt. It's more about like validating what they feel, not what happened. It's more about, can I understand what you're experiencing and can I make it you less alone right now? That's kind of the idea. So fight and flight will have a very similar feel. So one of the things teachers could do, but this is more school-wide, is to have a room like this, sort of like a quiet Good. meditation room. Or they could, if they can, which is not usual right. in a high school situation, is have a corner in the room yep. where the students can go and just you know face the wall and really get uh, sort of find their center. Yeah, I've seen that before. Not, I don't, I don't think high schoolers are as apt to take use of that. I think they could, but they tend to prefer to be like, if there's something going on with them, they, they don't want an audience. They want to be alone. You know, so I think the room or sitting outside of someone's office, they're more likely to do that, at least with the, the kids that I'm seeing. The younger kids seem to be more okay. So eighth grade and under, they seem to be more okay. Eh, eighth grade is probably pushing it, but let's say sixth grade and under, and I might even be pushing it there, but they're more okay with like going to a spot in the classroom and just laying on a pillow and maybe putting on some headphones and focusing on one thing. Like that might be okay for them. If a teacher could organize, like, a, here's a spot to like, Go away. You can still do some work, but here's your spot to kind of regroup yourself and come back when you're ready to, or as you're ready to. I think I don't think it's a bad idea at all, but it's 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 takes a lot of anticipation. I think of what may happen or what our students may need, and so part of that might be a little space. Part of it might be if you have a kid who's in more of like an anxious flight state, it it feels like anxiety. When you're in flight, you kind of need movement. So in a classroom where you're expected to sit down, how do you incorporate movement and being creative about that? And it might be a fidget, a safe fidget that you've taught the kids how to use that does not involve being thrown, but it might be a fidget. A fidget is a way to provide movement in a very small movement it, to help use the flight energy and to help kind of focus a little bit more. Uh, there's also these things, what are they? They're like these bands that you can put on the bottom of chairs. Have you seen those? They're like I these haven't. huge, they're these huge rubber bands and they go on the legs of a chair. And so if a kid has more flight energy in their legs, they can actually use the bands to like push against. Sure. They can push it. They can kick it. So it's, they're still mobile. They're still on the spot. I'm sorry. They're still immobile. They're in their chair, but now they can use their legs at, for their flight energy. So it's another, it's like a leg fidget. Basically you, we know that not all kids do well with sitting and listening uh, in my district. Most of them seems like don't. So how do we prepare for that ahead of time and give and normalize some avenues for using flight energy, but also having a space to get away if you need to, and to normalize it and make it okay in the classroom. Well, I think also what's really important there, and, and what I really encourage teachers to do is to do this through co-creation. If the students know that there is a strategy that they can use for their benefit, like the teacher is, is transparent about that, and they have the vocabulary so that they have a conversation about it, then I think that they become really engaged, really participatory, collaborative, and respectful, not only to the teacher, but to their to themselves and to their classmates. So I love this idea. And teacher, I mean, we nobody, nobody should be sitting for so long. It's just, it's something from um, a methodology that was created a long time ago for yeah. uh, that we shouldn't be following anymore. But that's another thing. The reality is that students still are sitting too much. So I love the idea of fidgeting. Um, I just have one quick question backtracking a little bit. What, how does the brain interpret monotone as danger? Well, because this is, I, I like this kind of stuff. It's fun. The uh, evolutionary idea is that when, di we're going to go way back in time. When dinosaurs ruled the, the earth, there were these super teeny tiny mammals. They, and I think they lived underground mostly. So for them to survive in this environment, they needed to be able to communicate with each other in a way that was, this is going to sound corny, but like top secret, basically. <laughs> So they evolved the ability to talk in a way that reptiles couldn't hear. Reptiles could hear the super highs of like screams and squawks maybe, or like deep sounds like avalanches or growls. But we can hear this middle range of voice that we call vocal prosody. So the sing-songy quality of voice that kind of goes up and down. So up and down. So we could hear all those 
things. So if we lose access to that middle range, that vocal prosody, we go higher more in the scream sounding, which sounds more like anxiety and panic and fear or down lower into the base of an avalanche or a growl, those two higher and lower frequency or bands, they are a cue of danger that indicates something is wrong. If I've lost access to my ability to use vocal prosody, that tells your system something is wrong. Justin is either dangerous or is detecting danger that I'm not detecting. Does that make sense? I have to process a a little bit, but (laughs) yeah, it definitely makes sense. And what I'm thinking is, Teachers need to not be monotone, not just right. so that they they aren't boring. Our students' brains, from what you're explaining, is going to interpret it as this is not a safe place to be. It's yeah. not just that I'm bored. This is not a safe person to be giving me new information. Yeah. And so the kids who are more self-regulated and not in a traumatized state. So, tra- And by the way, trauma means that you're stuck in a defensive state. Trauma is not the thing that you went through. It's how you reacted to it. It's how it's the impression that it left on. It's the impact of that event on your body. So you and I could be in the same car accident. Like we're driving somewhere together. We're both in the back seat. So pretty much everything's equal as much as we can make it. And we'll get in a car accident. You might walk away from that and take a deep breath and say, oh my gosh, is everybody okay? And you're fine. Whereas I might be stuck in the car, or maybe I get out of the car, but I'm stuck in this like anxious flight state and I don't recover from this for like months and and cars are now a trigger for me. So the same incident can impact people differently. So, So what is traumatic is the way that we reacted to the same event. So I was traumatized, whereas you were able to walk away, take a deep breath and you were fine. You were not traumatized. So bringing that back to the classroom, the kids who are in a traumatized state, who are stuck in a defensive state, flight, fight, shut down or freeze, These kids can, when they hear a monotone voice or have the harsh lighting, or maybe it's a bit too hot or too cold or whatever, all these little things might send them further into their defensive state and they can't self-regulate through it. We mentioned co-regulation, self-regulation. So self-regulation is the ability to get back up into your safety state. Does that make sense? To climb that polyvagal ladder back into your safety state and take that deep breath and say, oh my gosh, that was, I'm okay. Are you okay? That's self-regulation. So the traumatized kids in class who hear that monotone voice, they are less likely to be able to self-regulate. So it's kind of like the monotone voice even like reinforces the stuck defensive state and they'll be less likely to be able to tolerate it. And it might actually send them into a more of like an anxious flight state where they're like, I got to get out of here. I'm done for the day. Bye. Whereas someone, a kid who's not traumatized and has more access to self-regulation, more access to their safety state, they'll just be bored. Like they'll hear that, they will hear that voice, which will take them out of their safety state and maybe they'll feel it, but it feels just kind of like boredom. Like they just are kind of maybe checked out, but they're not spiraling into dysregulation to flight, to fight, to shut down. They're not spiraling into anything. They're just kind of bored, but they can tolerate it. So what kids learn is important, of course, but they will not learn and practice and utilize and retain what you teach unless it's coming from a safe person in a safe environment. So before we go into what can I teach, ask yourself, am I being a safe person? Am I projecting safety? Do I feel calm? I think teachers usually get get into this profession because they love the kids and they love teaching. So do you still feel that? That, That'd be a really good question. I think is, are you still in in tune with that? Because the job can chip away at that as best I can tell. Do you still have that connection with your love for the kids. And if you can get to that place and you can feel that that's going to come off of you and that they're, they're going to pick up on those safety and naturally the safety cues are going to come out of you. So before you teach the kids, do I have, am I a safe person? Am I projecting safety? Am I coming from compassion and empathy and interest and curiosity and my own passion for what I'm doing? So if that's in place, awesome. The next, next question is, do I have a safe environment? Is my classroom a safe place for the kids to feel like they can relax. And there, there's some things that are out of your control, like maybe the AC or the harsh lighting. But one thing that's super simple that a lot of teachers do and is having tons of clashing colors on the walls. And this kind of this for my system, this is a lot. And there's always those like bulletin boards with like the trim around it. Does that bother yeah. you? That's interesting. It kind of does, but every every classroom has this. But I know it's from my system that it's always like polka dots on one border stripes on another border and it's super simple it's not a big deal it's not it doesn't not going to send me into dysregulation and most for most kids it's probably not going to either 
But you take that and it's, it's a visual clash, which might be a very tiny minor insult to what is calming. So compare that to like a blue and green kind of nature-y kind of feel to things. And neither of these is right or wrong, but ask yourself in my classroom, what do I have on the walls and what can I, maybe can I take some stuff down because there's always like tons of like kids artwork and this kind of rule and these class norms. So visual what is noise, actually, it's visual noise. That, that's exactly, yeah. that's a great way to put it. That's a great yeah. way to put it. And that visual noise is not a huge deal, but the visual noise plus, you know, desks being cl- too close to each other, maybe the, cause they're like they're crammed in there plus the AC plus the lighting, plus the teacher's monotone voice, plus this and that and the other thing. All these things add up. That's the way I, I kind of want teachers to look at it that way is these things add up. So what can you control in the environment to help provide a sense of more calm? So instead of visual noise, can you bring in a color scheme? Can you put a picture of nature on the wall, a trail, water? Then your lessons will have more impact. I think that's really, really important. Teachers need to remember their why. And if their why yeah. has has morphed, then they need to decide if they're going to leave the profession. And I was just speaking to uh, the executive director of an organization called the Ed- Educators Neighborhood based on Fred Rogers' ideology, which I just love. But it's all geared towards helping educators maintain or go go back to their why, figure out, you know, find a way to go back to loving why they became educators. And I think especially since the pandemic, although much longer than that, teachers are not served as much as they need to be. And they need to go into the classroom as compassionate people. And that's really difficult if they don't have the support that they really need. I have absolutely no doubt that what you're saying is, is, is correct. And I would really remind, ask teachers to remind themselves every day, why are you here? Did things, you know, go back to the, the way you felt before the admin did this, that, and the other thing before your union didn't, you know, fall through with whatever it is, or before this, before that, can you get back to that? Because that the kids will pick up on that. And instead of having a classroom where the first thing you do is like, check their name off. You're here, you're here, you're here. Instead of them walking into that, they might walk into you saying hi and make an eye contact. And I'm so glad to see you. Like that's going to be a much more impactful. And I've seen that. I've seen that with, with in a first grade classroom. It was really cute. The teacher, she did, she made these little changes in her classroom, like decluttering. And uh, she opened up a little more spaciousness and she welcomed them in the room versus getting right down to work and checking their names off. She welcomed them in. They got on the floor and did a check-in more of like a, kind of like an emotional check-in, not super emotional but like enough. It was, it was enough to be like, I recognize you. I see you. And it worked out really, really well. Yeah. And I love that. The little switch of just asking how they are. I was talking to a 14 year old who was having severe anxiety crises. And she said, if a teacher had just asked me how I was, that's all they needed to have done. And in three years of middle school, not, she said, not one teacher asked her again, we don't want to blame teachers. There's a heavy burden, but it's a simple question. And I love that you're suggesting that that could change the whole dynamic in the learning environment. You're right. You're right. All right. So then the obvious question is, how could people contact you? And do you do any sessions at, online? What I would recommend for people is if they're in a traumatized state and they recognize it, first off, go to my free stuff. I have tons of free content and I want them to, I think a lot of good, from what I hear from my listeners, and a lot of good can be done just from the free stuff. So go inhale my free stuff, my free stuff on justinlmft.com. My podcast is stuck, not broken. But if you think I'm a good fit, I, have to, I, I recommend that because... I want them to like spend more time with me through my free stuff. And if I'm a good fit for you, then yeah, reach out to me. We can work on, you can hire me as a coach to work on trauma, not just general life stuff. Like I'm very focused on what I want to work with. So if you're in a traumatized state, then work with me as a coach about present and future stuff, I think is appropriate. And I have a community, I have courses um, that people can, you know, opt into if they're, if they're interested in, interested in that as well. But the main place to go would be justinlmft.com. That's the the main hub. Okay. And we want people to call you. And we also pe- want people to listen to your podcast, which is Stuck Not Broken, which is also very, broken. very important mm. because there's always a way to heal, right? I think so. You? I have tons of hope. Yeah. And if, if it sounded pessimistic, I don't <laughs> want it to because there's there's absolutely tons, tons and tons and tons of hope and things that can be done. And the things that I'm hearing from my little community and from the people in my audience that are writing to me, it's like, oh, they're, like, they're finding some benefit either a lot of benefit or some benefit, but like they're, they're noticing, like, as I do these things, change is happening and having more awareness of their polyvagal state, having that awareness, that normalization, like there's just, there's a lot of good that can be done. So yeah, yeah I think it's, I have tons of hope for people and there's lots of good that can be done. 
Okay. Well, it's just your oozing compassion and your wealth of knowledge. So I really hope that people start, um, will call you and get the help that they need. And I really appreciate all of this information. I'm, I'm, we just scratched the surface. Yeah. Um, maybe we can have you back sometime, but I encourage people to. to go find out more details with at your podcast and your site. And I will include all of this in the notes. So Justin, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. This is a delight. So that was our conversation with Justin Sanseri. As I mentioned before, you'll find more information and activities on the polyvagal theory in the show notes, activities that you can do with your students that will give them some tools to deal with unexpected and uninvited experiences that may be hindering their educational experience. For more fascinating and educational conversations like this, please go to the list of other chats at Doorways to Learning with Donna and activities to introduce new information in interactive ways at scafflingmagic.com. In the meantime, have fun in your classes and please seek help for any trauma or anxiety that you may be feeling so you can have more positive experiences during your educational day. And I'll see you soon for more.